Welcome again to the Milt Rosenberg podcast. And as I've been saying lately, it is no matter of accident that the voice you hear is that of Milt Rosenberg. But shortly you'll hear the voices of two old friends, Charles Lipson, one of our original A-team, leading American political scientist and based at the University of Chicago, just back from uh, 10 days or so in China, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, uh, and Martin Kramer, who is an old associate. He's served time even at the University of Chicago as a visiting professor. Basically, his career, and it's a distinguished academic career, has been in Israel, uh, where these days he is president of Shalem College, the only liberal arts college in the country, but for many years associated with Tel Aviv University and uh, various other organizations, and in the process uh, one of the major contributors to an analysis of Middle East and Israeli affairs in the general context of contemporary politics. And speaking of contemporary politics, uh, Martin, um, it remains a puzzlement, just as the world was, or the outside world was, for the once king of Siam. What in the world on this day, and this day I sh should make clear, is September 12th, uh, of 2014, uh, one day after the uh, September 11th commemoration, what in the world is really going on around and in and through that which we now call ISIS? Well, ISIS doesn't call itself ISIS anymore. ISIS calls itself simply the Islamic State, um, IS. And uh, their claim is to universal sovereignty, not over... Of the world. Of the world, not just Iraq and Sham or Syria, uh, but they certainly over the entire region itself. The common caliphate ultimately of the world in total. In, um, in Islamic political theory, the caliphate knows no uh, territorial bounds. Uh, it uh, is a universal caliphate. There have been various theoreticians who at various times have said that if a sea separates two tech caliphs, there could be two. Uh, but the standard and classic version is that there should only be one. So this is Although it calls itself the Islamic State, it's really an anti-state. That is, it rejects the whole state system in favor of the uh, creation of a universal caliphate. A, f a distant prospect at this point in time, but a nascent, <clears throat> a nascent movement. The concept is really that of an ultimate theocracy. It is of a theocracy. I think more important is that it's a rejection of the order uh, with which the, um, uh, the Middle East has been, um, uh, has been structured around for close to 100 years. And what is that structure, if I may ask, uh, Martin? What is the structure being rejected? Well, the structure is a system of territorial states, uh, numerous territorial states, on the territory which once was part and parcel of the Great Caliphate, both the classic caliphate and the Ottoman Caliphate. So it's a rejection of what they see as an arbitrary division of this part of the world by imperial powers into statelets whose existence is meant to serve the aims of imperialism. The world has been somewhat shocked. America surely has been somewhat shocked by uh, the degree of systematic violence, terror, murder, murder is the proper word, undertaken as a matter of policy, obviously. Not only the two Americans executed in videos, beheaded in videos, but we've seen uh, other videos of dozens uh, hundreds of recently taken prisoners, or some of them maybe even civilians, just grabbed because they are not of the right faith or of the right intensity of faith and uh, lined up on the ground and shot down, shot dead. It rather looks like the early phase of the Holocaust before they built uh, the murder the murder factories. Uh, it begins to raise the basic question, which has been in the air for some time, what ultimately is Islam about? Is it conceivable, despite what many fine Islamic uh, preachers and apologists say constantly, that they are a religion of peace, which is now being misused by certain fanatics, is it possible that terrorist murder is the ultimate default position of Islam itself? Uh, well, first of all, let's put the... Um the violence that we've seen from the Islamic State in its Middle Eastern context, uh, is what we've seen any different than the way in which Saddam Hussein, for example, 
uh, it persecuted both Shiites and Kurds, including, by the way, I remind all, the use of uh, poison gas. Uh, is it any different than the way in which the Assad regime in Damascus um, has uh, taken the lives of close to 200,000 people since the outbreak of war there, including, again, the use of chemical weapons, just as the father, bombs. Just as the elder Assad did in an earlier instance That's right. That's in right. Syrian history. So it's a variation on a theme. I don't think it's an original at all. It's a variation on a theme. And the theme is uh, based goes back, I think, to the, um, uh, the premise of one of my late mentors, Fuad Ajami, who said that in the Middle East, you rule or you die. Um, and um, so it's a zero-sum game in which you intent, att- attempt to inflict upon your adversaries such pain and such horror that they will desist from challenging your power. And with this kind of terror, kill everybody that you capture, uh, uh, opposing armies fade away. That seems to be what happened with the Iraqi army only in the last month or two. Um, it is It is true that they are fading away, also because, to some extent, they're not defending their core homeland. You see, once you have a total breakdown along sectarian lines, everybody says, well, yes, there's an Iraq, but there's my Iraq and there's the rest of Iraq. I will defend my Iraq, but I won't necessarily defend with my life all of Iraq. What is my Iraq for the Iraqi army? For uh, the part of the Iraqi army, which is, which is Shiite, my Iraq begins in Baghdad and goes southward and doesn't extend into the western desert of Iraq, which is the Sunni heartland. And so what we have here are really people fighting for their ethnic and sectarian homelands. Um, and it's very hard to get people who have been sectarianized to actually offer their life in defense of a state whose borders are arbitrary and in defense of territory, which is not their home. Uh, so what is true is that you've had the melting way of the Iraqi army. Um, the Syrian army doesn't even try at this point to recapture those areas which are in ISIS control. Um, and uh, the only people who have a real um, determination to carve this out as their sectarian um, heartland is ISIS. That is the present, quote, Islamic State right. portion of Syria, significant portion of Iraq. Is it here to stay for quite a while? It's here to stay as long as uh, there's no one to destroy it. Um, until this point, uh, the Islamic State has had a pretty free hand. It's operated mostly in desert areas. It's conquered a couple of cities, Raqqa in Syria and Mosul in Iraq. Um, but otherwise, it's in areas that a lot of most people weren't, paid little attention to. They just took a Lebanese town. The they other took day. for time a Lebanese town, um, and they want to expand outward. But they got started in a vacuum, in a vacuum in which none of neither of the regional states, Syria or Iraq, had a great interest. And the United States and the Western powers had no great interest. And that's the key to understanding the ISIS phenomenon, looking for the vacuums and filling them. Charles Lipson. Uh, This is a brilliant analysis uh, that you've laid out, uh, Martin. It seems to me that the one positive element uh, is to think back about what David Petraeus uh, did during uh, the surge. We all understand that uh, the American part of the surge, but what really made it all work was the Anbar awakening, namely that the tribal militias who are Sunni in that part uh, of uh, Iraq uh, rose up against this kind of dreadful Sharia rule by outsiders, and that's still a possibility here. Uh, in fact, the only possibility, as far as I see, th- th- those uh, tribal leaders who've stood aside as ISIS has moved through, and uh, it, they were uh, backed by the Americans with close air support. That could still happen. There was a lot of bribery from us to them. That could still happen. Uh, so there is, but that won't happen in Syria. I want to ask. I want to turn to a uh, one of the subjects that Milt was talking about. Uh, which was the kind of killing. It wa- uh, the killing, the uh, marching these people off very much, as I said, like the Jews were marched off in Poland and places to dig their own graves and then shot and killed. But what really struck uh, the American public was beheadings. It was uh, journalists, to be sure, and that may have played a bigger role. That is, it got more play on our media because they were journalists. But it was the beheadings. Could you say something about the symbolic role of beheadings and why that seems to be a a certain kind of killing? It has a visceral impact 
mm-hmm. on others, but it seems to be something that is done for a particular reason, and I've never quite understood it, and maybe mm-hmm. you can clarify it. Well, the reason is that they believe in everything they do that they are reenacting chapters in Islamic history, in the glorious, most glorious chapters of Islamic history. The Prophet Muhammad also beheaded his adversaries, um, um, and sometimes prisoners as well. And it's well recorded in the um, in, in Islamic sacred texts, including a Jewish tribe, I might add. The men were all executed by beheading. So from their point of view, the whole process in which they are engaged in is a reenactment of uh, earlier glorious history. And that's a symbolism for them. Now, we look at it from the outside and we see something different. We see something that's a throwback um, uh, to, um, uh, to some other age. A kind of primitive barbarism. Right. Now, Let us not forget the French Revolution and the, French Revolution, and the invention of, of the guillotine. Uh, actually, beheading right. was, it was a kind of a modernizing yeah. um, measure the English that, the, Revolution. That, the, that the French uh, believed mm-hmm. that, they had, um, that they had, they'd innovated. In fact, it, had a lo- it has a long yeah. history in Islam. The interesting thing about the, comp- the comparison, as you mentioned, with the Holocaust is that um, both the um, Nazi Germany and Saddam Hussein carried out mass executions, marched people off and killed them with, gu- with bullets to the head or whatever, but they tried to conceal what they were doing. These people are not trying to conceal what they're doing. They're filming it. They're putting it in YouTube. And it's because what they believe it does is it magnifies for Muslim and Arab viewers the, the, the power that they claim to have, and they regard themselves as completely free of accountability to any Western notion of what is or isn't proper in warfare. That's and the best absolutely, explanation I've heard of and, that, and I appreciate it. And I it really also have. absolutely punctures all opposition, doesn't it? Uh, well, it's ter- it's, it has the effect of terrorizing yeah. people into submission. And, and, and Charlie rightly mentioned that um, to some extent we've been here before. There was al-Qaeda in Iraq— which attempted to oppose itself in the Sunni areas. The tribes rose up, but they didn't just do it with air support. They didn't just do it with, um, um, uh, with um, uh, the, root, the, 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 the political support of the United States. There Over was a the surge. Horizon there killing. was a surge. Yeah. There was a surge. Yeah. So they said, all right, we've got al-Qaeda in Iraq, but on the other hand, there's another countervailing power We can tilt the balance if we ally ourselves with a countervailing power, which is that of the United States. Now, at the present moment in time, there is no countervailing power. So what they're more likely to do and what we see them doing is cutting deals with the the Islamic State. Who is the they? The tribal leaders over cutting deals with the Islamic State, um, which which is willing, in fact, unlike al-Qaeda in Iraq, to establish an administration. Right? They want to administer the country according to Sharia law but also to provide all the services and, and so forth and so on. So they are cutting deals now with the, the tribal leaders who, looking around them, don't want to cooperate with the Iraqi government, um, which they see as Shiite-dominated, and don't see the United States except flying at high altitudes, uh, on, uh, putting the area under surveillance. You're, you're so. saying there is practical political consideration uh, leading many tribal leaders into alliance yes. with the Islamic State at least for the present. Is there also an ideological surge, quote, on the Arab street or in the Arab desert, for that matter? Is this the new, or rather the revived face of uh, uh, absolutely uh, terror-based Islamic expansion? What we're seeing across the region is the decline of Arab nationalism and its replacement with Islamism. All sorts of varieties of With Islamism. Islamic internationalism, so to Islamic, speak. Called Islamic internationalism, Islamic nationalism also. Yeah. Islamism is the word that most, uh, most scholars use. And if Arab nationalism was the default position. The Nasser position. Right, the Nasser position and its variants. You had the Saddam version, the Assad version. These were all versions of Arab nationalism, many of which were in, con- in conflict with one another. But if that was the default position for an earlier generation. What was it? Just for, stop for a second. Right. What it was the core position of Arab nationalism, so we can distinguish it from what you're saying now? Uh, the core position of Arab nationalism was the Arabs constituted a nation based on their linguistic and cultural affinity. So they weren't just Egypt and Libya right, and Syria. Okay. Right. And in fact, one of the main uh, object, objectives of Arab nationalism was the unification of the Arabs. 
You recall that Nasser himself brought about a, uni- a unity but between unified Syria in a secular way. and Egypt, but it was a, it was a, a predominantly secular movement. It had some Islamic overtones, but it was predominantly secular, and the idea was that if the Arabs united, they could face the colonialism, which continued uh, even after formal independence to uh, de- decide the fate of the Arab world, particularly backing mm-hmm. Israel. The, ch- the change here is that young people say, that it was the, the abandonment of faith which weakened the Arabs. And it weakened them through the medium of Arab nationalism. And if Arabs and Muslims would only return to their faith, they would be empowered again. Where's the intellectual base for all of this? The intellectual base goes back to the, um, well, it goes back to the 40s and 50s, um, when you had a number of theoreticians who came up with this notion um, the Arabs don't face imperialism in its modern form. They face what is now what, what is actually a kind of crusaderism. It's called by the West uh, and even by its Western critics empire. But what it is really is just a replay of the old religious hostility to Islam. And so Muslims have to rally around Islam to push back. Put this in a uh, longer historical context. I know that one of your teachers uh, was Bernard Lewis. Still at- is. It still is. The great Bernard He's into his mid-90s, I believe, by now. He is. At this point, uh, he's 90, 98 years old. 98 yeah. at Princeton. Um, and he's taken the long view as to what has happened to Islam over the last he, five. And he wrote the book, What Went Wrong. Exactly. And that's the book I have in mind. Uh, relate this to the, the larger Lewisian view. In the larger view, what we see now is a profound disappointment with the... Um, with the fruits of modernity in the Arab and Muslim world. They were told that if they modernized, they would become powerful. Uh, As once they were. As once they were. So they modernized. They did it selectively, of course. There's some aspects which they borrowed and some they didn't take. They didn't go as far as Ataturk in Turkey, who took wholesale everything. But they created, I would call, a hybrid modernization, which they borrowed elements which they thought would strengthen them. Some secularism was part of the mix, um, openness to technology, changing the status of women, all sorts of things. And they have been disappointed. Not only have they not gotten stronger, but relative to other rising parts of the world, for example, East Asia, they're actually weaker than they were a century ago. And so we have this profound disaffection, disillusionment, and disappointment. And how does it manifest itself? We made a mistake. We embraced modernity. It disappointed us. So let's find something else. Let's go back to our true roots. I, I think there's something very important here about the failure of uh, what, they, what they would consider the failure of Arab nationalism. There was a failure. It didn't succeed. Um, and it was that, it seems to me, that set the stage for what came next. If it had succeeded in the same sense that modernization succeeded uh, – in uh, in Japan, uh, after Japan was opened in the late nineteenth century, there was a distinctive Japan uh, version of modernity. We know it all crashed and burned during imperialism in the Second World War, but it's revived. There is now uh, a Chinese path uh, to modernity, and uh, at least so far, it has succeeded. It. It didn't succeed in uh, the Arab world. So there's a search for something different. One possibility was to say we didn't do it the right way. Uh, we, we should have modernized in different and more effective ways. And one um, place that's trying to do that in a different way uh, combining an element of uh, Islamic, a strong element of Islamic ideology, but economic modernization is Turkey. And I wonder if uh, any of uh, them look to Turkey as a, a successful uh, model. Mm. Erdogan's Turkey. Well, Turkey, Turkey actually took a different path than the Arabs took. Under Ataturk, they went for wholesale westernization. They shed the clothing, including... The, the fez. fez, yeah. Um, they they discarded the Arabic-based alphabet, which they had. They declared the uh, equality. They declared the equality of women. Um, the Arab world's modernization was partial. Oh, and by the way, one more thing that Turks did was ultimately they implemented a democratic system. 
with free elections. So they took all that because they had been over the over centuries more exposed to European ways in any event. It was easier for them to take on these attributes of And Europe. that was strongly advocated and defended by the Turkish military. That's right. Um, the Arabs never had their Ataturk. Nasser never went as far as Ataturk did in his reforms. He did some land reforms. He did some modernization. He, he, he tried to upgrade the status of, of women, but he never went as far as Ataturk because the Arabs believed that their traditions were so important to them that they could find a middle way, perhaps as Charles indicated, the Chinese did or the Japanese did. They would find a middle way. The problem is that the middle way they found failed. Now, just to finish his thought, he said, was, was there some other thing they could have done which would have made it succeed? And there are people in the Arab world who says, say, yes, the area in which we failed to modernize and which was most important was in the way in which we govern ourselves. We never embraced, we never embraced democratic pluralistic government. And so you have a small number of people, let's call them the liberals, who oppose the Islamists and say, no, 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 the way to power isn't to go back to Islam, it's to go that step we never took. Those are the people you see on CNN. That's right. They, they, they find the six of them who are in Tahrir Square and interview all of them because they speak English, and then the American public, uh, and perhaps the Europeans mm -hmm. as well, uh, infer that they represent a much larger fraction of the public than well, they actually do. Well, what is do. the Arab mass mind these days? I know mm -hmm. it would vary from country to country, but overall, what do we really have? Do we have a general urge regressive in its quality back to authentic, true, nativist, uh, fundamentalist doctrine in the, the Quran, in classic Islam, and then translated or transmuted into the sort of political program we now see, which is to knock over anything that is a vestige of democracy and establish firm uh, uh, authoritarian uh, Sharia-based law. Incidentally, looking forward once again to uh, reviving the intention to destroy Israel, which we haven't mentioned yet in this conversation. We have a, a culture war between two sides. In each country, the balance is different. Look uh -huh. at Egypt. Egypt had Muslim Brotherhood rule it, uh, briefly after the fall of Hosni Mubarak. And people the military saw, got people rid of saw it. the chaos that it that it ensued. Yeah. Twenty and gave, million people gathered to protest it. And, and and at the end of the day, the military came back, the strong man back in power, the pharaoh, if you will, conforming to an also very old tradition in Egypt. So in Egypt, you have one model, and they're aligned also with the Saudis, who have a monarchy, um, and who say our kind of rule is the only stopgap between us and chaos. And on the other hand, you have the Islamists who say return to the Sharia is the only way in which we will empower ourselves. But there's something quite paradoxical there. This is merely a side note yes. or a sidebar. Uh, but it is confusing just what the Saudis are really up to. Because at the same time, Wahhabism, uh, their version of Salafism, their version of Islamic fundamentalism and Islamic restoration, has been funded by them to the extent of multi-billions around the world. They are, in many ways, the funders, the founders, and the propagandists for this kind of regressive return to, quote, pure, aggressive Islam, even though they are frightened of it. Well, the Saudis have a particular view of this, and it's that it's only the way they define true Islam that matters, not what they define in the Islamic State or in Iran or any place else. So well, how they, do they define it? So they have used some of their money in order to influence other groups. Really to bring pernicious. Them. Wherever it and, spreads around the world, it's been a right. it's and, been a force for uh, all kinds of conflict. And in yes. many cases, for blowback for them themselves. They themselves. By That's the way, the point. biggest the biggest That's fence, the biggest border fence being built right now right. in the Middle East is between Saudi Arabia and Iraq and yes. Syria because they don't want the Islamic State overflowing in their direction, even though there are some this... princes in Saudi Arabia who have funded these people. Well, that's it. I was about yeah. to ask, is this possibly a matter of trouble inside the family, the vast royal family? Are there different factions, different princely factions, some which favor resisting all of the trend towards regressive Islam, and others who in fact favor it, support it, fund it, and are enthusiastic for it? Well, the Saudis have a view 
that there can be a Sharia-based system, but it has to be open to the West and it has to be open to the idea of monarchy. They don't call themselves caliphs. Yeah. They're kings, right? So um, that's the Saudi model. Uh, and the fact is, though, that some of their money winds up in the hands of people who have a different vision. And now they've realized themselves, they realized it even when al-Qaeda emerged, that's why they expelled Osama bin Laden, is that it can blow back against them. Osama bin Laden, you'll remember, after having been so close to the Saudis, then turned against them. And this, what's important here is that the Saudis in this battle at the moment are aligned with Egypt and the existing order. Now, the question is whether the United States and others can bring about a uh, mobilization of this, full mobilization of the Saudis against groups like the Islamic State, Hamas and others. And I think that there's a chance for that because, look, if you are the protector of the holy places in Mecca and Medina, who is a threat to you on the theological level? A man in Iraq who claims to be the caliph of the Muslims. Baghdadi is his name. And obviously, from the Saudi point of view, this is a threat to them as well. And what we have to do is build a coalition which will help them be part of the mobilization against it. They already have the motive. By the way, sidebar number two, who exactly is uh, uh, Abu Bakr uh, al-Baghdadi, the supposed leader and inspirer of this whole new Islamic state. He's a man with a very thin theological education who worked his way up through, um, um, through al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, and um, I have to say that having seen him speak, he doesn't impress me as being all that charismatic. Um, but in some respect, he was the last man standing. You remember that some of the other key figures, such as Zarqawi and others, were eliminated. Um, I think he's, um, he has a you know, kind of totemic value um, as being the, the, the figurehead of the, of, of the state. But he does have considerable organizational skills. Um, and uh, it was a particularly brazen move to take personally the caliphate upon himself. Because everyone looks to the caliph as a personal exemplar. Uh, and uh, Baghdadi has a pretty thin record, but then he doesn't have a lot going against him either. We are two days away at this moment from uh, President Obama's speech, laying out his, quote, strategy. Uh, we, uh, three of us certainly, watched it, heard it, as did the world. What exactly uh, is the significance of that strategy as he elaborated it? just two nights ago. Charles Lipson. Well, the reason we can't answer that for sure is that in order uh, to uh, have an effective strategy, the president would, in effect, have to renounce everything that he's done in the six years of his presidency up to now. Uh, he had a strategy for the uh, Middle East. It began with his speech in Cairo. Um, and it was part of a larger strategy, which was a friendly outreach to traditional adversaries that would have been particularly— And it also started with a kind of apology. We were wrong. We didn't understand Absolutely. you Absolutely. And, nice. and not just an no. apology for the Bush administration, sort of an apology for what America had done throughout its history exactly. in the region and the West had done. So we were apologizing in particular to Iran. And notice that what that meant was that when there was a popular uprising in Iran in 2009, instead of backing it, we spoke in a friendly way and actually used the term, uh, the formal term of the Islam state of Iran and so forth. Uh, we reached out to the Muslim Brotherhood and its um, and its offshoot Hamas. By the way, both uh, both of these things just absolutely terrified the Saudis. Uh, and pushed them much further away from America. The U.S. withdrew abruptly all of its troops from I Iraq. What did that mean? It meant uh, that uh, the groups which had finally, at long last, after the Anbar, after the surge in Anbar awakening, had begun not to trust each other, but at least to trust America, uh, were willing to form something like a fragile uh, unity government there. We, we not only ripped all of our troops out at... Um, at once and left them to each other's tender mercies, but we also ripped out all of our intelligence agents, so we were uh, deaf, dumb, and blind there. That left the government uh, in Baghdad, which was um, 
a Shia government with no uh, real support except that they looked uh, to their friends in Iran for it. They then formed, in effect, a Sunni militia on steroids and began killing Sunnis. They looked around, and ultimately it was in that context that ISIS was formed. Where does that leave President Obama? It leaves President Obama having done a lot to create the mess and the question and having promised that he won't put back in American troops to fight. Uh, so, uh, And you know that you can't drive out uh, successful uh, insurgencies without troops on the ground, so he's got to get local groups. I've said that there's a possibility that he could get those among the tribal leaders uh, who are Sunni in um Iraq, but uh, the possibility, not a certainty, but there's no possibility of that working in Syria. And we don't know uh, from a President Obama's crisp, clear, and I must say forceful speech, whether he's going to do anything other than bombing and killing to reverse the basic strategic mistakes that have characterized the last six years. Therefore, the way to handle ISIS or Islamic State is what? Well, I'm not in a position where I'm going to give advice to um, the present administration. I'm more interested in its underlying assumptions and where they're going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the underlying assumption of the Obama administration has been that the United States made a mistake getting onshore in the Middle East. It has always been better positioned to defend its interests offshore. Uh, and it was a retreat to an offshore position, which was what the Obama administration sought to achieve by withdrawing from Iraq. Now, once you decide to go Back offshore- Back to our strategy against the Barbary pirates. Right. Once you're offshore, which you can argue is a, it, it served in the United States well in various periods of time, uh -huh. the question is what you do- um, in relation to the parties that are onshore. Now, you can either back your allies to the hilt with weapons and political support and diplomatic support to make sure they win. The Mubarak's, uh, right. you know, what right. we did with Mubarak. Right. Or, or, but also the Saudis and Israel and the whole list is long. Right. Or you can say, you know, I'll just try to cut deals with our adversaries. Which is what Iran, the Obama it, the administration did. And that's what the Obama administration did. It actually weakened the confidence of its allies in its resolve, not because it took its soldiers away. Everyone knew the Americans would go. They're not a permanent presence. But by not backing its the allies to the hilt. You see, in, in the Middle East, everyone knows who their friends are and everyone knows who their enemies are. And it's quite clear. You stand by your friends and you oppose your enemies. Obama seemed to, the, to, to America's allies confused. He wanted to make of America's enemies friends. And the way he did it wasn't by threatening them, but was by cajoling them and trying to entice them and appease them. And so this and is, I think— And that's failed completely. And this has failed. Now, it's failed completely. Now, ISIS is a, an, an interesting case. Now, ISIS didn't exist when Obama formulated his overall approach. It's something new. And but Al-Qaeda did, and ISIS right. is begot by Al-Qaeda, right. is it not? But there are two ways to pursue this against ISIS. One is to say— you know, we're going to take care of ISIS because it's a threat to American interests. But then how? And in yeah. a partnership with whom? You can go after ISIS and still appease. Appease Iran, appease Bashar Assad, because they are also potential allies in the battle against ISIS. So the question that I think— And if you do that, you just drive the Saudis and the and right. uh, you drive yeah. uh, uh, Jordan and all the others right up the wall. Exactly. And so the question really is, when it comes to ISIS— which of the two alternative paths is Washington going to follow? Is it going to follow the path of bolstering its allies, its long-term allies in this strike? Or is it going to be casting around for new friends in Tehran That's and Damascus? That's why I couldn't answer your question, Milton. Martin put it beautifully. We just don't know. But we do know the instincts of this administration. The president uh, will not back our allies to the hilt. And if you think that he would, look at what he's done in Egypt after the Muslim Brotherhood was overthrown. Well, he's refused to do that. Some of the critical commentary, uh, commentary that followed directly upon his speech only two nights ago, was he has indicated really that the policy is to, quote, kick the can down the road uh, for the next president. 
Well, he may be kicking the can to... down the road, but he will be doing a lot of bombing. The problem is an F-16 and a drone yeah. are not a strategy. Uh, They're simply a tactic. They'll kill people, but they have uh, real limitations and blowback possibilities. I now will share with you my prophetic dream of last night. Uh Maybe it wasn't a dream, but it was a well, dream. Well, we talk about Egypt, and the next thing we know, you're interpreting dreams? <laughs> well, it was a hypnagogic state before I went to sleep. I see. How ultimately is ISIS to be defeated? Ten years from now, if we're having the same conversation, and looking backward to the rise, the uh, dominance, and then the decline of ISIS or of IS, we will note that basically it was done by the military. Not our military, not the uh, German or the English military, but by the Egyptian army and the Turkish army, both of whom are confronted by something which uh, unhinges their definition of Islam and unhinges their sense of separate state sovereignty, and with considerable uh, intelligence assistance and other kinds of hidden assistance by the Israeli military or the Israeli force generally. Is that inconceivable? It's... It's difficult to conceive. You've named two states, Turkey and Egypt, yeah. which decades have passed since they've really projected any meaningful power beyond their own borders. The Turks did it a bit in northern Iraq, opposite the Kurds, but the Turks are not, the, are, are not a state which is anxious to get involved. Well, the Egyptians projected some border. military power against Israel and didn't win. Well, but, but uh, they a couple produced, of generations ago yeah. and on its own territory. Um, well, on into the Sinai and so on. Well, but the, the Sinai was there, considered their territory. To be sure. So these are not um, – the problem with the Middle Eastern states is that they don't um, – <clears throat> they don't very often seek to project power beyond their own borders because they have trouble just controlling their own borders. Well, my broader point, of course, and, is that Islamic states have to defeat ISIS because we yes. won't. They ha or they have to do it in some kind of partnership with the United States now – or an out any outside power which is willing to stand up to the – to, to go up to the stand up to the task, what we see now, and here I want to pull back and get the bigger picture. Mm. What we might be saying ten years from now, <clears throat> what we're seeing now is the breakdown of that order that I, we talked about earlier. That's existed for a hundred years of the states, and what has emerged, and you have it in Hamas and Hezbollah and the Islamic State, is what I call territorial Islamism. What is territorial Islamism? Well, we know the kind of Islamism that said, let us in the political game, and we want to run in free elections and maybe take over. That's what happened in Egypt, briefly. But Islamists are now saying it doesn't work. We get into the political order, sh power sharing, we're corrupted, and at the end of the day, they throw us out. What we have to do is seize territory, which is ours, and which we can control, and which we can militarize. And that's what you have in Gaza. That's what you have in parts of Lebanon. And that's what you have in the Islamic State. Islamic groups, they can't seize the whole state, but don't want to be political parties in some uh, multi-party system. They want political control, and they want to militarize the turf they sit on, build those rockets, um, um, implement their own law and their own administration. And so what we're seeing very slowly across the region, and we're going all the way from Gaza on the Mediterranean into the desert in Syria, is we're seeing the territorial... Islamic statelets. But what, and, and then we could be 10 years from now in a situation where there is an Islamic state. It's still there. No one, uh, no one had the wherewithal or the determination or resolve to put it down. And you have a patchwork of these Islamic principalities, all of which host terrorist organizations, are militarized and are in constant conflict with their neighbors. And what Hezbollah learned after the 2006 uh, war with Israel is that if you try to extend the borders of that territory uh, into Israel or into a strong state, you're pushed back in a brutal way. The question is whether Hamas will learn that after uh, the punishment that it uh, just took in Gaza, whether it will even uh, survive uh, there. But let me let me go on and say and answer Milt's question about what we may see in the future. The most the most hopeful possibility would be that Iran uh, Iraq essentially uh, turns into three uh, three coexisting 
uh, groups. Uh, they follow kind, the Biden plan. Uh, yes, but uh, with a kind of moderate, but it would still probably have uh, the formal character of an Iraqi state, but with three largely separate territories, a Shia area in, in the south, uh, a, um, a Sunni area ruled by the tribes because of what I, I mentioned, rather than uh, ISIS, yeah. but perhaps and Kurdistan. ruled and and Kurdistan uh, with uh, ISIS in effect pushed back into its civil war in Syria fighting for the control of the Syrian state I want to say that we've not mentioned two crucial actors in all of this and in the remaining time uh, it might be useful to talk with Martin about them one is that the spillover of the Syrian war it has really jeopardized the stability of uh, the government in uh, Jordan, which is a linchpin to the whole a- area. And it's not just an external threat in Jordan. There's been a mobilization of Islamists within Jordan itself. And the other is what to do about Iran. The president himself has made uh, statements about Iran not getting a nuclear weapon that are not, and uh, we won't tolerate that, that are not credible to any actor in the region. I think most people, including most uh, American foreign policy analysts and most Israeli analysts, and I've spoken to both, think that the likely uh, outcome there is that Valerie Jarrett and Barack Obama cut a deal with the Iranians that leave them just short of a nuclear weapon, but one that they could make within a few months, that they call that uh, collapse and appeasement uh, a triumph, and that it leaves uh, everybody else in the region including the Saudis, petrified, but with no particular options uh, that are effective to act. So I want to turn to uh, uh, I want to turn to what happens to Jordan and what happens to Iran in the time that remains, Martin. Well, Jordan certainly um, does face a real challenge from extreme Islamism. Um, some of the biggest uh, supporters of the fight against the Americans in Iraq had come out of Jordan. Um, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi comes from Zarqa, which is, uh, which is in Jordan. Um, and he was among the leaders. And so there's a certain resonance for these ideas. Now, I wish I had a dollar for every time that someone came along and said that the Jordanian monarchy was in peril. Um, it's been in peril for a long time. And somehow they always find the wherewithal um, to do what has to be done to protect themselves. Uh, this was true of King Hussein of Jordan. This is true of King Abdullah, his son. So um, with, an, and it's a small country, we're not talking about the need to defend endless borders or a large population, which could, sp- areas that could spin out of control. It's basically Amman, the capital, and a few other uh, provincial cities, uh, and an e- a border which can be easily defended by a resolute force. So, and a population, uh, however, that is now majority Palestinian. It's right? majority Palestinian, but also you have a very... Uh, close identification between the East Bank Jordanians and the monarchy, uh, which has had uh, its ups and downs, but which I think is in a a steady state. So um, um, I would see Jordan not simply as imperiled, but actually as a possible linchpin for launching the counteroffensive against ISIS, uh, and also for uh, playing a constructive role in whatever order follows the Assad regime in Syria. In a way, Jordan is the ideal partner of the United States in the Middle East. It doesn't have the baggage that the Saudis have with their philandering in directions of extremism. Uh, it, is, um, it has an army which I think is effective. Uh, it is good at patrolling its borders uh, and, and defending its sovereignty up to its borders. And so Jordan is the ideal ally. It should be at the top of the Obama administration's agenda as America's Arab friend in the Middle East. Um, but it's not. It's not. Instead, it's, uh, it's seen as a sideshow. Um, and I, I, would, I would hope, with Israel's encouragement, by the way, and Israel's done everything in, that, that it can also to, um, uh, to, um, to strengthen Jordan in troubled times. It would do so again, I think, if, it were really, if Jordan were really threatened. It's time to put Jordan at, in the first place in America's regional alliance. 
When I was a little boy growing up in Brooklyn, in a Jewish neighborhood, uh, the standard gag was the Jewish grandfather who hears that uh, the Dodgers are likely to win the pennant and looks worried and says, is it good or bad for the Jews? Mm. <laughs> uh, and I ask, of course, of a leading Israeli intellectual, is the mess right now good or bad or indifferent for Israel? When you ask that question, you know, is it good for the Jews, the assumption is that, well, the Jews could make a decision one way or another which would affect the outcome. And I don't know that that's the case here. I'm skeptical about that. Israel can't fashion the region in which it finds itself. Um, certain threats have diminished with the changes we've seen. For example, conventional armies. Where are they? Where is the conventional army in the Arab world which is going to threaten Israel? Even Hezbollah, with which Israel went several rounds, has been preoccupied in Syria, uh, fighting on behalf of the Assad regime. So if there was a danger in the latest contest with Hamas of a second front opening up uh, in the north, so it, it this is a very important point, just before you continue, yeah. Martin. For most of Israel's existence, uh, the fundamental strategic threat was that it would face a two-front or more mm -hmm. war, that an army from Syria and an army from Egypt would close in on it, maybe with the Jordanians, and how can you fight on two fronts? This was the old German problem. They faced France and they faced Russia. Uh, that's now gone, is what Martin is saying, or diminished so significantly. But Israel faces other threats. Yeah, and the other, the other, the other threats we saw exemplified over the summer um, in, in one form. These are these Islamist principalities which see themselves as being in perpetual war with Israel. There's no prospect of an agreement or understanding with them. Um, <clears throat> and they are building, slowly building power. Um, it is asymmetrical. They don't have the same wherewithal that Israel has, but they can create what is a, dis a, a disruption of Israeli society at such a level um, that it has profound implications throughout. And, and let the, me give you an the, example. The you know, one, one, of the, yeah. one, of the, one of the false analogies which was made, people were saying, well, what if you know, Israeli spokespeople were saying, what if you in the United States had people firing rockets on Texas from Mexico? I said, that's not the proper analogy. It's what if you had rockets falling on Chicago and Manhattan. Yeah. Tel Aviv is the very core and center of all of Israel's economic activity, the great, the great majority of its um, uh, cultural activity, 70% uh, of the population. This is the, the center of the country, but the which was paralyzed, almost paralyzed, for the better part of a month. But the solution so, to all of that, not solution, but the way of managing it, would really be the Hezbollah uh, solution, namely Israel establishes deterrence by virtue of what the last war was, mm -hmm. just as it did in 2006. And in effect, Gaza is split off from the West Bank so that it's a separate statelet, uh, called that or not, and deterred. No more tunnels, no more firing in. And uh, then uh, Israel still has to deal with the West Bank problem. That's the most optimistic uh conclusion I think you can draw from this. Does that sound reasonable, Martin? Well, that is an optimistic conclusion. And there were, there's going to be continuing debate in Israel about whether in the long term Israel can coexist with a Gaza principality under Hamas. And you remember the 1982, Israel made a different decision. It said we could not have the PLO in Beirut and on our borders and they acted to remove the PLO, and the PLO basically disappeared. And there are people in Israel today who say, until it was res resuscitated in the Oslo process. By the U.S. By the U.S. There are people who today who say <laughs> in Israel, if um, that the day will come, maybe it wasn't this round, but it might be the next round or the next round after that, we'll have to do in Gaza what was done in Beirut. It will be much more costly than what was done this summer to both sides. Um, but I, I think that's an open question. It's going to be heatedly debated in the Israeli political system as to what to do the next time. I've got four or five minutes left. Therefore, I ask you to now develop uh, the, uh, to now indulge the historian's penchant for long-range thinking and even long-range projection. That is to say, uh, allow Tennyson in all his love, uh, uh, all his fine silliness in Locksley Hall, when he views the future as uh, the time when the war drums throb no longer and the battle flags are furled. 
in the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. World peace ultimately is coming. Think about not 10 years from now with regard to the Middle East, but think about 100, or if you want, 500. Will this ever end? Will there ever be a time when, in fact, we will look back with historical curiosity at the way in which that Middle East once was so befuddled and be, and be mired in death, tragedy, confusion, uh, misspent careers, and uh, total dysfunctionality. Will that end? And if so, how and when? Well, how did it end in Europe? Um, powerful forces came in from the outside and reordered Europe. But only after it had thoroughly exhausted yes. and, and yes. killed itself through internecine wars. Yes. Now, why did outsiders come in and reorder Europe? First and foremost, the United States. Because Europe was a source of great industrial power. It could threaten the world. Its disorder exported into world wars could destroy and disorder the world. The Middle East isn't like that. The Middle East is a place in which very few of the states can even exercise power up to their borders. At this point in time, they don't have weapons of mass destruction. Um, and so no one wants to make the investment in changing the Middle East because the Middle East isn't threatening enough. There is no imperial Japan there, right? There is no Nazi Germany there. And so everyone says, let's just contain the, the, the maladies of the Middle East and hope that they will, they will, they will blow over. Um, looking further down the line, I would say that either, either Middle East un undergoes some radical transformation from within, which we don't even see the beginnings of the signs of at this point in time, or at some point there'll be so many, um, so, so much wherewithal will accumulate in the form, for example, of weapons of mass destruction in the hands of Iran and then other states in which the, the wider world, led hopefully by the United States, which will still be a great power <clears throat> 50 years or 100 years from now, that's a hope, not a projection, uh, will come and, and, and reorder. Now, the United States tried to do some reordering in the Iraq War, didn't have great results, said it wasn't worth the struggle, and walked away. Um, now it says we have another threat coming, emerging in the form of ISIS. We'll go in, we'll meddle a little bit, maybe we'll be able to contain it. The question is whether there's anyone's going to come along and say this needs the same treatment that we gave to Europe. This needs the same treatment that we gave to parts of East Asia, to put them as part of this community of mankind as equal and constructive uh, partners in, 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 the, in the development of, 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 um, of humankind. And that's, I don't see that happening yet. And that's a tragedy of the Middle East. Um, it's too weak to threaten, and because it's too weak to threaten, it's not worth the investment that the United States made. And every so often, some people talk about a Marshall Plan for the Middle East. But to have a Marshall Plan, right, you have, to, you have to see the Marshall Plan as leading to the alleviation of something that threatens you fundamentally. The Middle East doesn't. And in that weakness, I think it's more likely to look like, um, uh, to take the place of Africa, really, as being heart of darkness, which everyone is happy to neglect as long as there's no spillover. Right, and it's, uh, I've studied the Marshall Plan. I know the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was a friend of mine. And I can tell you that it was not only a lot of money, uh, it had two other features that were very important. One was that there was a fixed short time in which the money was pumped in. We could see a good result uh, that we thought would come out after that short pump priming. But the other crucial element was that we could have maximized our power by giving money directly to Germany, directly to France, directly to England, we told them, no, we will only give the money once you work together to create joint plans, and we will fund the joint plans. Nobody in the Middle East is really close to that, much less, even with each other, much less including the Israelis, which are the dominant economy in, in the region. I would say one other point. Uh, we have another region to, reor to work on reordering first, and that's East Asia. 
with a growing China, and we do have a huge stake there. China wants a different role in East Asia. We've got to come up with a way, in, and China is acting in an aggressive nationalist fashion. We na- And uh, nationalism has cropped up again in uh, Japan, which is very uh, threatening to both the Koreans and the Chinese. The Chinese hate the Japanese, and so their nationalism is very conflictual. The Koreans have become more nationalist. We're going to have, and there's the threat of the meltdown in North Korea. So the United States, uh, to the extent, that was the whole point of the pivot to Asia. We have much more interest there. So I would just say, that the basic problem the United States faces is uh, in Aesop's fable, uh, the difference between the hedgehog and the fox. The, uh, the fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one thing, one great big thing. And the United States, because of its global interest, is always in the position of the fox. It, it's got so many interests. And I think you're right in saying that the Middle East won't necessarily be at the top of that agenda in a positive way. It may be at the top of the agenda in a negative way if the lethality of bad actors continues to grow. I think you're telling me that Tennyson's vision doesn't extend to the Middle East. Well, I wanted to trump you. You're going back to the 19th century. I wanted to go back uh, to ancient Greece, uh, Milt. But mm-hmm. I, I think we all know that only Milt Rosenberg could inject Tennyson into a discussion <laughs> of the Middle East. Well, we could indeed, except that time is gone, we could indeed uh, inject Thucydides uh, and the eternality of war because all nations live with a a jealous concern for interest, they want to grab what they can, and an equally paranoid concern for how the neighbors want to do the same. So you have to defend against them by preempting them. And also, you're guided by, and this is very important, I gather, in Islam, uh, for you're guided by the ultimate search for honor. And uh, honor is at issue uh, in all the conflicts we're talking about. And my honor requires that I come to a close with warm thanks to Martin Kramer and to Charles Lipson for joining us in this conversation.